Sergio Pellis was my Sergio Pellis, Dr. Pellis was my uh, master's and PhD supervisor at the University of Lethbridge. Um, under him, I studied uh, this topic that he's going to talk about today, which is play fighting, but it's Serge that actually introduced me to control systems engineering and cybernetics, which is how I met Fred and how I'm connected to all of you at UCSD. Um, and that's through Telluride. Nonetheless, Sergio is a, a Board of Governors Research Chair in Neuroscience and a Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge. He's been there since 1992, if I recall. Is that right, Serge? 1990. 1990. So um, doing lots of cool stuff. Uh, he studied, I remember, play fighting in um, Australian magpies for his PhD dissertation in Australia. And he's originally from Australia, uh, but has moved and did postdocs in, in Florida and uh, Israel and before moving to Canada to pursue his career at the University of Lethbridge. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Serge take over. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, this opportunity to tell you about what, what, what my lab's been doing for the last 40 years. Um, probably can only tell you what's been happening in the last sh shorter period than that, because we haven't got time to go through the whole the whole spiel. But a core focus of my research has been uh, play fighting or rough and tumble play and its impact during the immature years, during the juvenile period on, on brain development and social skills. So here's a typical thing that you may recall yourselves doing when you were younger. You're having a, this little play fight or rough and tumble um, bout with, with a peer and you're basically essentially um, try, trying to get some advantage over your partner, but you do it in a, in a nice way. You'll, and you'll see why that niceness becomes really important. <clears throat> so, so the first thing we need to dispel is that the relationship between play fighting and serious fighting, because unfortunately, over the last 50 years, progressively, more and more people have seen this kind of behavior as indicating violence. And so it tends to be suppressed at, in schools and kindergartens and so on, which, as you'll see, is an unfortunate um, thing to do. So what's the relationship? There is none. Studies that have directly looked at, looked at children in schools and looked at who's engaging in most rough and tumble play, play and who's in, engaging in most real aggression found no correlation. So if you're engaging in rough and tumble play, it doesn't mean that you're being aggressive. Also, if you have a close look at um, playful and, and, um, and fighting sequences, what you see is that the facial and bodily gestures that are involved are very different between the two and you can tell them apart quite quite readily and importantly as we'll see as we go on what happens is that um, the consequences that come out of engaging in in um, play fighting in childhood are not the same as those that emerge from serious fighting so on many different levels Play fighting is not serious fighting. So get serious fighting out of your mind. We're looking at a playful form of fighting, which has some unique properties, which you'll see are very important for developing um, the social brain and the associated social skills. Now, there's several possible benefits that have been identified by looking at in children's in children playing. And again, Tony Pellegrini has been a, a major... Uh, Hang on, always forget my laser pointer. Tony Pellegrini was a, a leader in looking at rough and tumble play in, um, in children. And what he found was that again, in schools, looking at um, prepubescent pre uh, children, particularly boys, those that engage in more play are more popular. Essentially, if you're good at convincing people to have a play fight with you, 
you tend to have more friends. And we all know that um, one of the important indicators of success at school is that you're not alienated from your peers. So having greater capacity to, to engage with your peers makes you less anxious, makes you happier in the school environment, you're more likely to learn. Similarly, what he found was that when he compared boys who have had different degrees of um, rough and tumble play and, and tested them for their ability to solve social problems, such as, for example, having two kids sitting next to one another in a room, giving one of them uh, a soft drink to, to drink, and then the other kid has to convince the one with the drink to share it with, with him or her. And so you can figure out how, how good are they at getting cooperation from other people. And what he, what he found was there was a positive correlation between how much you engaged in play and how well, how good you are at solving social, these kinds of social problems. But the problem with, with looking at kids is that, well, this simply could be a correlation. It could be that if you're more socially skilled, you're more likely to attract playmates and you're more likely to solve social problems. So the play may not be doing the actual um, doing anything other than being a byproduct of already being socially skilled. Or alternatively, it could be the, the, the causal relationship that engaging in play improves these skills. Now, the only way you can do that is uh, test decide the difference is by actually doing an experiment. And of course, mo most parents would probably not want to enroll their children into an experiment where one, one child is put in isolation, not out to interact with other children, and the other child is put in with peers. So you really can't do this with kids for obvious ethical reasons. So that's where you need an animal model. And the, the animal that I found to be most useful for manipulating play experiences and looking at the consequences of those um, manipulations on subsequent social behavior and brain development is the laboratory rat. So what does what does it look like? I'll, I'll hold it. It was working before, so hang on. I'll have to show it this way. Can you still see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Now here's a couple of young rats there just around 35 days of age. And you can see them engaging in this repetitive uh, wrestling. They follow one another. One gets on top of the other, then they wrestle and, and move around. And this just goes on and on and on. And um, one, one of the beauties of, of this behavior is that it is, oh, there it is, it's working now. Um, one of the beauties of this behavior is that it's really pleasant to look at and most students who have to sit for endless hours looking at videotape scoring what's going on don't find it b highly burdensome simply because you can feel the joy that the animals are having and that has a contagious effect on, on the researcher. But just let me show you what what actually is going on in, in these sequences. So th these are also two 35 day old males. If they were females, they'd be doing exactly the same thing. So what you have is one rat approaches the other one, in this case from behind, reaches up towards the back of the, the neck, the nape area. And as it's about to touch it, the other one turns around and blocks the other one from getting access to the nape. The one that was attacking continues pushing this one ends up falling on its side. Then the one that was attacking continues to reach around, trying to get at the nape. And this, the one on the on the bottom ends up li lying fully supine on its back, so blocking access to its nape from this one. And then from the supine position, the one on the bottom lunges up at the other one's nape. And then the other one blocks that with its hind foot. Mean, 
and pushing it down. Meanwhile, the one on the bottom now is starting to use his hind feet to wiggle and push the other one, pushes the original attacker off, gets up, and now he attacks the nape of the other one. So you can see that this panel and this panel are the mirror Im image of one another, except the animals have reversed roles. So essentially in play fighting in rats, what they're trying to do is contact the partner's nape and then nuzzle it with the snout. And, and um, it would take a whole other seminar to tell you why rats should find nuzzling somebody's nape with their snout exciting. So you just have to accept that that's what rats do. That's what they like doing. And we'll, we'll look at the consequences of animals engaging in this kind of behavior. Now, this play fighting behavior is very common from shortly after weaning in, in the early 20s days of age to just before um, or just a little bit after sexual maturity, say in their 50s. And then it continues to occur, but a much at a much lower frequency. So the peak level of play fighting occurs around this um, juvenile period between being weaned and, and, and sexual maturity. And the question becomes, well, fine. So we know that they do a lot of this at this age. Well, what happens when we prevent them from engaging in this behavior at this age? What are the consequences? And the typical experiments that were done starting in the 50s, but really uh, hit off in the late 60s and 70s was to, once they're weaned, you put individual weanlings in, in cages like this, basically in solitary confinement and let them grow up to post-sexual uh, post maturity and then look at their behavior, look at their brains relative to peers that were reared in this kind of environment. They've got not only more space and lots of things to explore, but also lots of other rats to interact with. So you have rats that are socially reared over this juvenile period versus rats that are reared in social isolation. And then when you look at a variety of, of um, aspects of their psychology and, and neurobiology, what you find is that these rats that have been reared in social isolation over the juvenile period, they have impoverished cognitive skills, they have poor emotional regulation, their short-term memory is not very good, their impulse control is weak, and for our purposes, their social skills are simply not as good. So animals that have been reared in that social isolation, when they're adults, they're put into, a say, a colony, they are very likely to, to um, stand out like sore thumbs. Uh, they, 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 so they become attractive to the residents. Then they behave poorly, which leads them to being beat, beaten up usually by the dominant male in the colony. So their, their social skills are, are poor. But if we look at all these features, all these kinds of skills uh, things that comprise executive functions. So as, as a general statement, what we can conclude is that this social isolation rearing leads to impoverished executive functions, some of which translate into poor social behavior. Now, the problem though is that complete social isolation you're isolated, you're missing a lot of experience, not just play. You're missing a lot of social experiences. You're missing a lot of, as you can see from those little restricted little cages that were in, lots of other non-social experiences. So how can we be sure that play is really the important ingredient in the development of these executive function skills? So over the the decades since those experiments in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, various ways have been looked at to try to isolate the effects of play relative to other things that you're depriving 
the animal of incomplete social isolation. So here's one paradigm where you rear two rats on opposite side in the same enclosure, but on opposite sides of a perforated um, screen. So in this case, they can see one another, they can hear one another, they can smell one another, and they can even, um, when they're at sleep, sleeping, they can huddle next to one another. But what they cannot do, they can't cannot physically interact with one another. And this kind of paradigm has been repeatedly shown that when you now look at these rats as adults, they show all the kinds of impoverishments that I mentioned. But still, this is not ideal because this is still sort of semi-social isolation. And so there are other avenues. One that we took and we pioneered this with um, Heather when she was doing her master's in our lab is you get a juvenile and rear it with an adult. And what we know is that from our own previous studies on, on, on within litter play activity, adults really don't like playing with juveniles. Ju and so if given a choice, the ju juveniles will play with other juveniles and the adults will happily ignore them. The adults will be happy to huddle with the juveniles, um, um, groom them, sleep near them, and so on, but they generally avoid playing with them. So we use this way of manipulating the amount of play experience this animal receives. <clears throat> but there's still a bit of a problem here because this poor juvenile still has to live with this big burly adult who really doesn't care very much to do the kinds of things that the juvenile likes doing. So another strategy that's been used, and I'll show you how we use, we, we've used this strategy more recently, is to rear peers together, but our target animal here is reared with a peer that either through um, some manipulation like uh, drugging this animal or doing brain lesions on this animal, or using the, uh, two strains where one animal is, comes from a high playing strain and the other animal comes from a low playing strain, you basically manipulate in any of those ways, you manipulate how much play this animal experiences. The advantage of this is, this is not a big surly adult. It will still engage in some play, but not as much as it would get if it was being reared with one of these same type of rats. So all these approaches have shown that you do get an effect on, on, um, on the kinds of skills I mentioned, and as I'll show you, change, changes in the brain. So together, what these, uh, hang on, let me just go here, forget about that. So together, what, what these show is, and if, if, you, if you want to read some, re, some review papers where we review not only our own literature, but other people's, just contact me and I can send you these, this, this paper and this chapter, and you can track down all the original uh, papers, empirical papers. But together, what they show is that there is really strong evidence now that at least a good portion of those executive function skills that are diminished in rats that have been reared in social isolation, a good chunk of them is due to not having appropriate play experiences with peers in the juvenile period. So essentially we've shown this causal link between play and the development of executive functions and associated social skills. Now, linking this to the brain, because I know I'm talking to a, a bunch of people that are more interested in the brain than rats playing probably. <clears throat> Once we got to the point where we convinced ourselves that yes, indeed, play does seem to be important for the development of executive functions, but how can we physically demonstrate that that is related to real changes in how the brain functions? And 
the first approach we took was try to figure out, well, where in the brain are executive functions, well, at least what parts of the brain that are important for regulating executive functions. And the important one is, one of the important areas is the prefrontal cortex. So we hypothesize that juvenile, juveniles that have been deprived of social play in the juvenile period should develop altered prefrontal cortices. And here's a rat brain, here's a cerebellum, here's the cortex, and right at the front here, this area here is the prefrontal cortex. And this is the area we're, we're looking at. And if you cut coronally here, what you would see is two lobes, one on each side, and there are regions in the prefrontal cortex that were particularly attractive to us. And the reason why I mentioned the two lobes is because the next slide, I'm gonna show you a coronal section and I'm only gonna show you one lobe. So for, for various reasons, one of the most important being that in, in the department uh, that I have been working in for the last 32 years, there happens to be a guy who's about, uh, I think he's about six, seven years my senior, and his whole career has been spent studying the prefrontal cortex. So when we started seeing a pattern emerge, I approached him, his name Brian Cole, <clears throat> and asked him, well, where, where should we look and how, how, how are we going to look at it? And indeed, he, he co-supervised the work that Heather did with us for her master's. And so based on a long history of knowledge about both clinical and experimental studies with uh, clinical for humans and experimental with other animals, such as monkeys and cats and so on, he suggested that the two places that are likely to be really critical is this area, the medial prefrontal cortex. So this is the other lobe would be sitting on this side. So this is, that's why it's medial. And the other area he suggested is the orbital frontal cortex here. And the eye would be sitting around here somewhere. So that's why it's orbital frontal. Okay. So these are the areas we're going to look at, and we're going to manipulate the play experience. Now, the question is, how are we going to manipulate that? And as I told you, the, the first step we made was in using um, uh, a youngster being reared with an adult. So shortly after weaning, we paired up uh, the weanling with an adult, an adult, and as, uh, as the, the, so this is the experimental condition, the control condition is having a juvenile being reared with another juvenile. So a weanling with a weanling and they grow up together, this animal grows up with an adult. And the idea is this animal, if this is the one we're comparing this one to, it should be getting way more play experience than this one. And there's a little caveat here that <laughs> the other labs have shown that if you rear juvenile males with adult males, the adult males actually get quite aggressive with them. So they beat them up a lot. So that juvenile male is not only not experiencing much in the way of play, it's actually suffering defeat stress through most of its juvenile period. So this didn't really work very well with, with males. So we chose to use females and females, adult females will tolerate juvenile females that won't beat them up or anything they just try to avoid playing with them so this would this would be a much more stressful thing if we try to do this with males and then we really wouldn't know what's causing the changes if there are any in the prefrontal cortex of this rat with this rat but much to heather's chagrin had we had this clever brainstorming session where we thought well if if this rat is going to experience more play than this rat, why don't we add a third group and ha now have this rat as our target rat being reared with three other siblings? Because we knew from other studies we've done that there's a contagion effect. So if there's more animals around you playing, you end up playing more than if you only got one other animal to play with. 
So this animal should now experience way more play than this animal, and this animal should experience way more play than this animal. So we should get a graded effect, more play, more effect on the brain. Of course, why, why this was annoying to Heather was that it meant that she now tripled the number of brains that she had to cut, stain and score. But fortunately, we did this because we didn't get the effect we expected, but we did get a serendipitous uh, finding that actually was quite informative. So now, after all the cutting and slicing and dicing, here are the, the sections of, of the prefrontal cortex. Wanted to look at cells from the medial prefrontal cortex and compare them and compare those between the two conditions, control and experimental, and same with the orbital frontal neurons. And here's a pyramidal neuron from, from the prefrontal cortex. And what you see is a cell body, and it's got these uh, dendritic projections, both apical and basilar. And then each one's got little branches. And then if you look closely, each little branch has got all these little spines. And these are the spines that make connections with, with, other, with other cells. And so it forms the synapses. And you can measure the complexity of these cells by looking at how, how many branches there are, how long the branches are, and then within the little branchlets, how densely packed are the, are the synapses. And what we, and this is the royal we, all the hard work was done by Heather. But what we found was that having a sibling to play with led to the neurons from the MPFC to be pruned. They were simplified. There, were less, there was less branching and fewer sina, um, spines and so on. Interestingly, when we looked at the neurons from the orbital frontal cortex, we got a, a different pattern. So for the orbital frontal cortex, whether you were playing with a sibling or whether you were living with a sibling or an adult, had absolutely no change on the, on the orbital frontal neurons. But what did affect the orbital frontal neurons was how many partners you were living with. So for the medial prefrontal cortex, it turned out whether you had one sibling to live with and play with or three siblings to live with and play with, you had exactly the same effect on the medial prefrontal neurons. However, if you were living with three um, uh, peers, then you had way more complex patterns of dendritic arbor in the orbital frontal neurons than you did if you were living with one peer or with one adult. So the effect was that if we have the medial prefrontal cortex, compare that to the orbital frontal cortex, we look at the animals with an adult partner, both are at baseline. But then if you have a peer, the, the complexity of the cells is decreased. If you have three peers, the complexity of, of the neurons is decreased to the same order of magnitude. So it didn't matter whether you had one or three animals to play with. For the orbital frontal, it remains at baseline where they have one adult partner, one peer partner, but if you had three peer partners, the complexity increased. Now, of course, an obvious quest, the problem is, yeah, but here we're sort of, you got three peers. So it could be just the overwhelming effect of all this interaction with three peers that's really driving this change. So another experiment needed to be done. The whole thing was repeated, but this time with either having an adult partner, a peer partner, or three adult partners. And as you can see for the medial prefrontal, baseline with one adult partner, baseline with three adult partners, but pruning with one peer partner. For the orbital frontal, baseline, baseline, increased. So it doesn't matter whether you're in a cage living with animals that you spend a lot of time playing with, or simply in a cage where there's lots of other people in there 
sorry, for me, rats are people, so I'll keep referring to them as people. If you're living with three other people, just the fact that you're having to figure out, hey, um, you know, Jane's different to Mary and I've got to alter my behavior. This has an effect on the orbital frontal cortex. So what can we say? That from all this, we can conclude that play prunes, the, the, the experience of play prunes the neurons of the medial prefrontal cortex and interacting with multiple partners, whether that those interactions involve play or not, maintains the complexity of the neurons of the orbital frontal cortex. But we have a bit of a problem because I already said, yeah, adult females tolerate uh, juvenile females, but they're still adults. So if you're a juvenile, you're still having to, you know, probably mind your P's and Q's in a way that you wouldn't have to if you were living with someone your own age. So we wanted a less stress, avoid any hint of stress in the, in, in the, um, in the paradigm. So we switched to most recently, my, one of my recent uh, PhDs who finished last year, she explored using the, the paradigm where you have peers together, but one of the peers provides less play experience for the target animal. And so what we used was the animals we've been using all along in the experiments that Heather did, which was these Long Evans hooded rats. And we housed Long Evans hooded rats either with another Long Evans hooded rat as our control. And for our experimental, we put a Long Evans hooded rat and put it living with a Fisher 344 rat, which other labs have shown to be a play, a low playing strain and, and, and so has um, pr provides less play experience in the juvenile period for this animal compared to if it were living with another Long Evans. And let me, let me, let me see if I get the numbers right. This, this rat here, when you buy them from someplace like Charles River, costs us something like $21, this is for a weanling. This one costs us something close to $70. So we, I just couldn't afford to run all the combinations that Heather had done in her experiment. So we wanted to just say, okay, to start with, let's see if this paradigm will allow us to see an effect on um, the medial prefrontal cortex. So we had enough rats to have pairs. So pairs like this and pairs of Long Evans, Long Evans. If we wanted to do the, the, the multiple partner effects, the, the cost would have tripled and so beyond my, the carrying capacity of my grant at the time. But with this, what we found was that, and I'm just showing you here, that this is a, con a control rat and this is one of these Long Evans reared in with, with, a, with a, a fissure. And what you can see here is the green is the, is the actual neuron. And here you can see the cell body. Here's the projections, apical and uh, basilar. Here's um, the cell uh, body. Here's apical uh, projections. Here's basilar projections. And this is done on a thing called neurolucida. So the, the images are scanned and you scan them at different levels. So you can recreate these as three dimensional images. And then because of that, what you can do is do something like take the end of each projection and connect it up in these geometrical shapes. And very simply, what you can see is that the control animal, that is the Long Evans, who was reared with a Long Evans, has a simpler, smaller uh, medial prefrontal neuron than this Long Evans that was reared with a Fisher 344 rat. And we actually got the quantitative data to show this, but it, I'm just so chuffed about these uh, images that I had to share them with you. Because just by eyeballing, you can see, wow, 
there really is an effect here on, on the neuronal pruning. So, so for the MPFC, we have confirmed using this um, other paradigm of rearing discordant peers together, that we showed that for the medial prefrontal cortex, we do in fact still get this uh, pruning effect of play relative to uh, uh, having experienced less play. So this confirms the MPFC work from the paradigm that Heather used. Now that this has worked, that's now worth the expense of, and I'm building this into my next grant cycle, it's worth the expense of actually doing the, the multiple partner things to our com combinations to see if we can actually get the same effects on the orbital frontal cortex that Heather got using the methodology she used. But this, this is sort of a really heartening that a different approach, different way of analyzing it, different paradigm, and you get the same effect. It starts making you believe that, that it's true. So, yeah. I'm just going to skip right through this because I haven't got time to explore this. I'm just going to try to keep focusing on, on the consequences on the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, sorry, on the prefrontal cortex and the two areas that we've shown to have these rearing induced changes. So, in Heather's study, what she found was that the MPFC is altered by, by being pruned in the presence of having at least one peer with whom to play. The orbital frontal cortex, it doesn't matter. Play doesn't seem to matter. What seems to matter is the number of partners you have. Now, so Heather spearheaded this, I don't know, when, when she started her master's, I think it was 2008 or 2006, something like that, and had to go through multiple rounds of, ex, of experiments in order to tie up the role of number of partners versus play, etc. But I'm, I'm one of these sorts that really believe that, you know, unless you can replicate what you what you've shown, it doesn't matter how cool the, the, the data you get are, it may not be true. So just as Heather had finished her master's, I recruited a new master's student who came in and using exactly the same methodology that Heather did, she, uh, he now replicated the findings. And what he found was, that we could actually replicate the medial prefrontal cortex findings. So an adult partner, a peer partner, or three peer partners, we get the pruning effect on the MPFC like Heather showed. But for the OFC, whether you had one animal or three animals to live with, you have no change. There's still the OFC neurons are still at baseline. So you can imagine the a lot of crests fell at this point the first obvious assumption is okay my my graduate student's a lemon he didn't do it properly but he did because made him rescore reanalyze re the whole thing again and rescore uh, different neurons the same answer came up so there's something wrong here so a closer look at the details of what Heather's experiment looked like and what Brett's experiment looked like, because, because Brett wanted to, yeah, replicate what Heather did, but of course he wanted to also do something new. He wanted to start looking at some of the, some of the psychological, cognitive, behavioral influences on, on, on a, adults that have been reared in these different conditions. So what he did was a slight modification to Heather's experiment. And, uh, sorry, we'll go back. 
what Heather did was, I remember I told you that by the time they get to sexual maturity, that peak play period is diminished. So Heather killed her rats, sorry, sacrificed her rats at 60 days of age, perfused the brains, stained them, et cetera, et cetera. But because Brett wanted to look at, well, some, some aspects of their behavior as post 60 day old animals, he didn't sacrifice his rats until they were 100 days of age. So that led us to think, well, hang on. So there's a difference here of 40 days. Maybe it's the length of time since the initial effect that's important rather than the effect itself. So Brett, for now in his PhD, replicated all this and did an experiment where he actually took groups of rats and sacrificed them at different times. So he's at the juvenile stage, and, and these are all now compared across those different conditions that, that I mentioned, either with peers or with multiple partners. And what you can see, when you look at juvenile brains, you had their the, the baseline. But now, when you look at them at 60 days, the MPFC neurons have been pruned, and the OFC neurons have retained a larger um, dendritic arbor just like what Heather found. But now when he had a cohort of rats that he, he left until 100 days, what you can see is that the MPFC effect is still there, but the OFC effect disappears. Now, why? <clears throat> well, what I didn't really have time to show you because I want to make sure there's some time left for questions is what does the MPFC do for the animal and what the, does the OFC do for the animal? What we have shown is that the MPFC is important for coordinating your behavior with a peer. So through lesion studies and subsequently with um, studies looking at these play deprived animals and what they're like as adults, what we've shown is that MPFC um, diminished rats, i.e. either brain lesioned or, or socially manipulated um, changed MPFCs, what happens is they're less able to coordinate their behavior with another animal. And this is where their problems start arising and why they get into fights and so on, because they start becoming out of phase with one another in their, in their activities and they can make mistakes and if you're in a situation such as interacting with a strange adult male you've never experienced before, if you make an error in your movements and how you coordinate what you do what, with what he does, you can end up getting into a fight. And that's exactly what happens. So coordination seems to be an important thing that uh, the MPFC contributes to, social coordination. Now, if you think about it, once you're trained up to be good at social coordination, you should be able, that's something you probably want to keep your whole life. You don't want to let it lapse. So if you, if you are ducking, if you want to effectively duck from being hit in the face by somebody's fist, you want to be able to do that in all kinds of contexts at whatever age and with whatever opponent. However, what we've shown with the OFC is that it's involved in in allowing the individual to modify its behavior depending on the identity of the partner. An obvious example is if you're interacting with a, a dominant animal, you probably want to behave differently than if you're interacting with a subordinate animal. So if, if you're interacting for dominant or another subordinate, you probably want to behave differently. And that's exactly what we found that uh, damage to the OFC leads to you, you're basically treating everybody the same and in the wrong circumstance that could lead you into trouble because you're not supposed to right so so that th these are the two different skill sets that are involved here now it should be the case that if you're a rat if you're good at coordinating your behavior with another rat, 
you should be able to do that, like I said, in all situations in the future with whatever animal you're interacting with. However, once you, you leave the, the litter that you've grown up in, the rats living colonies, over your lifetime, you're likely to interact with novel partners, novel animals, which means that you have to continually update who's, who's who, what can I do with whom, etc. So you want the OFC to be able to be adaptable in the future, not to who you knew when you were young, but who you know now. So we hypothesized that the OFC, unlike the MPFC, should be changeable later in life. And uh, a, a postdoc who was in uh, Brian Cobb's lab, Derek Hamilton, he, he cottoned on to this problem and he came up with a, a way of testing it. So he said, okay, well, let's get adult animals. We use females because we could pack four of them in, a, in the shoebox cages we had at the time. And so you now have animal A and she's living with these three other animals. And once they learn to be with their group for a couple of weeks, then for the next two weeks, every day, what you do is you take these animals. And so for the control animals, you take them out of their home cage and you put all four of them together in a new cage. A little bit of novelty leads to a little, to a little bit of more excitement, some interactions and so on. But essentially, this animal is now still interacting with the same three animals that it's been living with. The experimental animals, however, this animal is now put into a new cage daily for an hour, but with three females she's never seen before. So with three strangers. And then after two weeks of daily being subjected to an hour of this change, we could compare the brains of this animal with this animal and what Derek found, for, oh, so first of all, uh, in terms of looking at what they do in these cages, what we found was that in, in this experimental condition, they do a lot more playful wrestling and a lot more investigation of one another. They sniff each other's anogenital area a lot, more so than the animals that know each other, but are in the new cage. Now, what effect does that have on, on the prefrontal cortex? Well, for the medial prefrontal cortex, it remains unchanged. So you still got that same level of pruning that we see in socially reared animals, but it doesn't change after two weeks of either being exposed to the same partners in a new cage or to novel partners in a new cage. However, the OFC, now, if you're exposed to the same partners in novel cage, nothing, cha nothing changes in, in the neurons of your OFC. However, if you're, reared, if you're exposed to novel partners in the novel cage, you get um, an increase of proliferation of the dendrites of the orbital frontal neurons. Now, one of the novelties here, of course, and you, for those of you who work on rats, you know that the, a lot of social information they get is by through olfactory means. So we did a parallel study. Again, we, Derek did the lion's share of the hard work here. Um, a parallel set of studies where you put animals and you expose them either to the scent of the same animals or to novel a novel scent. So now you're just experiencing novel scents, but not novel animals. And what, what he found was that you do get some changes in the dendritic arbor here with novel scents, as well as novel animals, but the effect of olfaction alone is smaller than the effect of um, in, in, having to engage with the whole animal. So suggesting that having to negotiate interacting with um, new animals really forces your 
the neurons of your OFC to become more complex because now they're having to get more information about do I know you? What are you, what are you like as a person? How do I behave with you? Etc. What are you going to tolerate? What are you not going to tolerate? And so on. Okay. I might finish after this next section. Um, so we, we've identified what seems to be important for the OFC, but what's important for the MPFC? What are the play-derived experiences that are critical for the MPFC? Well, one possibility is simply the amount of play. You play more if you're with a peer than if you're with an adult. You play more if, if you're with a peer, uh, same strain peer than with a, a different strain peer. So when we looked at pairs of animals, young females with uh, young, um, with, with adult females and compared their play with what they play like with peers, what we found was that if you look at the total amount of play, there's no difference. So if you're a juvenile interacting with an adult, you have the same total amount of play experience than if with a juvenile. But as you can see, in the case of the juvenile adult, that's the juvenile that's providing the majority of the play. But still, in terms of just the physical act of playing in a 10 minute trial, you're getting the same amount of play experience. So it doesn't seem to be the total amount of play that's important. What does seem to be important is something that's reflected here. Remember I showed you that uh, rats will go into this supine position during the wrestling, and that's done to protect the nape from access by this animal. But then this animal will also sometimes counterattack. And so this animal on top has to do two things, restrain this animal so that it can try to reach around and get at the nape, but also restrain it from launching counterattacks. And an effective way of doing that is by keeping both hind feet on the ground. And so you've got a firm base of support from which you can use your forepaws to control the movements of this animal. But sometimes, and particularly in the juvenile period, the on top rat does something really bizarre. It stands on the bottom rat with all four paws, making itself on a squirming base. So the, the support is much reduced. And indeed, from about a 30% success rate in counterattacks here by the one on the bottom, it jumps up to 70 to 80% in this situation. So in fact, this animal is putting itself in a position of making it easier for the partner to successfully counterattack. <clears throat> and so what we realized is that these kinds of maneuvers are important for ensuring that play fights tend to be uh, reciprocal so that both animals get a chance to win and lose. And think about yourself as a kid, if you're in, engaged in rough and tumble play with someone that always wins or always loses, like you, that, that's not interesting. It is, you need some competition, but you need some help from the other one to not be over out competed all the time. So that means that this rat has to use executive function skills, figure out, okay, how many times have I successfully put this guy on or, or this girl on, on her back? And what, what, what should I do if it's been too long? What should I do in order to help facilitate the other animal to gain the advantage? In this case, stand on, on the other animal with all fours. There's lots of other tactics they use. So one way or another, they self-handicap when to allow to facilitate role reversals and role reversals are a good measure of how effective animals are at, at uh, making these judgments at the right time to, to make sure that there is reciprocity in the interactions. And so now here's adult juvenile pair and here's two juvenile pairs, two things to notice. First of all, the percent of role reversals, which is a, a a measure of successful counterattacks is way higher here in the juvenile juvenile pairs than it is here. So this is a significant doubling 
of the amount of role reversals. But this is really the key thing. Look at the experience the juvenile has here in producing these role reversals. Very few here, about 50% of them with another juvenile. So it seems that experiencing the decision-making needed to ensure role reversals and so maintain reciprocity in your playful interactions is the critical thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll take a couple of minutes to conclude and then I'll turn it over to questions. So what, what can we conclude? That reciprocity during play between partners is the essential experience necessary for the development of the neurons of the medial prefrontal cortex. And that the changes gained in the juvenile period are permanent, they last a lifetime. So for example, what kind of, uh -huh, that's why. So look at these kids playing, bang, hit on the head, falls. Now this kid, this kid here has to make a decision as to what did this guy cheat on me? Was he being serious? Was he not being serious? Has he done this before? How, how, sh how should I respond to this unexpected kick in the head and so on? I.e., you're having to make judgments about what the other person is doing, whether you're rat or human, okay? So <clears throat> those sorts of skills, those sorts of experiences are derived from play and they lead to permanent changes in skill sets that are related to being able to judge what, what a situation means and what to do about it. What, what I've already shown you is that play by itself is not, is not essential for the changes we saw in the OFC. And the changes in the OFC that happen in the juvenile period do not last forever, but rather are probably continually updated uh, due to changes in who you're living with over your lifetime. But in the juvenile period, even though it might not be the case that <clears throat> um, play itself is, is necessary, as again shown in this example, we've got three kids playing together, okay? And again, if you think back to when you were kids, you, you tended to play with multiple kids. And one of your key sources of experiencing multiple partners was through play. And for rats living in a colony, once they're weaned by the mum, they've got their, their siblings, they've got um, peers from other um, litters that were born at the same time. And all the kids tend to congregate together. And since what they like doing is playing, playing provides an indirect way of ensuring that you get experience with multiple partners. So play either has a direct effect on the MPFC or may have an indirect effect in the juvenile period, at least, on the OFC. And both of them together lead to changes in areas of the prefrontal cortex that affect the executive, that refines executive functions and so improves social skills. Sorry, that's sort of a lot, a lot of stuff, but hopefully, that bottom line is the one that will resonate with you and stay with you after you've forgotten all the other details right here. Okay, so just to finish off, I wanna thank all my students and collaborators have made this, done a lot of the hard work to make this possible. And most of the money to run the, the animals has come from uh, NSERC from Canada. Okay, so. I'm done, and if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So yeah, please ask questions directly to to Serge, or you can write them on the chat, and we'll read them to Serge. I have one. Um, very fascinating, Sergio. Um, thinking about this and, and watching all this from the perspective uh, of uh, the predictive brain. 
I, I can't help but uh, notice that in peer-to-peer uh, -peer interactions like this, uh, there's a tremendous amount of cueing that has to be picked up on, picking up the, uh, what your partner is doing, what their intentions are, predicting what they're going to do so you can anticipate um, and thereby develop a lot of prediction skills in the process. And having a sibling at the uh, same age that's in a playful mode, uh, a mood at that same age, is kind of a cheap way to get lots of experience like that. And what I'm wondering is if there's a way to rig an artificial environment where you get the same amount of unpredictability, where you have to pick up on cues that aren't necessarily social or play uh, oriented, but where you have to make lots of predictions and anticipate in a lot of ways. And could you get the same effect? And I have no idea how you could rig an environment like that, but a solo environment where they have to go through the same kinds of anticipatory maneuvers uh, to see if it has the same effect. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, how, how you would rig that, I'd have, I'd have to give some long, hard thought to. But there, there, there are a set of experiments um, done from, uh, for, forget his name, just, ah, man, I just lost his name, just had a senior moment. But he was one of Harry Harlow's um, students who then built a lab of his own. And, you know, the Harlow experiments where you rear uh, an, an infant, monk, a rhesus monkey with a surrogate non-real mother, and so you can manipulate the kind of um, social experiences it has. And what you find is that those animals have diminished um, all kinds of problems, including social ones. But in one experiment, what they did was they had basically... The, the mother model figure dummy sitting there in the middle of the cage and in another in experimental condition they had that same model but rigged up on springs so that it sort of bounced around the room in in unpredictable ways and the the young monkeys that had the immobile mother versus the young monkeys that had the mobile mother, even though they're both artificial things, the one that had the mobile mother, the, the infant had, or the young, older infant, had to now deal with the fact that it had to duck this object come flying at it or bumping into its back and so how to react to it. And when they did their standard things of looking at how, how good the animals were at social integration later in life, they were both bad, but the one with the mobile mother, and so experiencing some of these unpredictability things you mentioned, were, were better than the ones with the immobile mother. So suggesting that maybe the kind of rational, the kind of logic you're using has some merit to be worth pursued. How exactly we're going to do that with rats, I'm not quite 100% sure, but, but one possibility is rearing rats with uh, rat robots where you can um, program to behave in certain ways that that the other rat, that the real rat doesn't know what algorithm that rat's using the robots are using and so you can introduce some of that um, unpredictable stuff that the animal now has to learn how to figure out to predict right maybe uh, andrea chiba's irat would be something that could be used for something like this indeed uh, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Yeah, I have one quick question. Thank you so much. So this is an amazing talk, by the way. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, one question I had was that, so you have these uh, structural changes that you observe um, you know, in brain slices. And I'm wondering if, um, if there's any uh, activity also, also uh, measured uh, and, uh, or, or connectivity maps um, during these changes. It's, it's very fascinating. Yeah, um, the, the, there is a lab in, in the Netherlands who has tried to focus more on the physiological changes, particularly in the MPFC of these neurons. 
And what, what they have shown is that the play deficient rats, they, they do have um, less dopamine transition, uh, transmission in the cells, in these, um, in these neurons, in the MPFC, suggesting that there is a physiological level change as well. So in an ideal world, what I would like to see happen is uh, be able to measure both the physiology and the anatomy of these things and, and relate them to what kind of uh, behavior is going on. There is a lab in Germany that has been looking at not quite rough and tumble play, but uh, something close, at least mimicking some of the reciprocal exchanges that you get in rough and tumble play, and that's hide and seek. And when and, and they get direct recordings from neurons in the MPFC, and what they find is that you get different patterns of activation depending on whether you're in the seeker role or the hiding role. And, and, in, and they just published one uh, beginning of last week or the end of the week before, um, lo looking at whether, also looking at whether you're observing other rats playing or whether you're engaged in the play itself and you get different patterns of activation of, of these multiple neurons and in how they talk to one another, depending on the particular role that you, you're in in, in in the context. So, yeah, I th so I think having direct measurements of what's going on in the brain, along with manipulating what's happening, and so being able to translate these anatomical and physiological changes to actually how they translate into um, changes in patterns of, of activity in the relevant neural circuits, I think is the way of the future. And uh, at my age, I probably won't see it, but certainly something that I would encourage um, people starting out their career and interested in trying to make sense of play, social play and social behavior generally, and are interested in rodents. I think that is the way of the future. Uh, I have a question. Um, is there uh, any correlation between the rough and double play and uh, how social animals are? Like, uh, like for like animals that spend their uh, adulthood like alone, like uh, versus the one that spend like together with other animals. Is there like uh, more play with the, the for the animals that spend time with others as an adult, or uh, is it uncorrelated? Um. To, to a degree. Um, so what I think is starting to emerge is that, because even animals that have that lead a relatively solitary life as adults, that there are certain occasions where some social effectiveness is important, such as when males and females have to come together to, to mate, and especially for the females, when they're rearing young mam mammals, that's the female that end up rearing the young. And so there has to be some minimum level of social skill that particularly true for females, but true for both males and females at some point. And so the reason why I'm saying this is um, a study on, on Syrian golden hamsters used our paradigm and replicated it, showing that in, in Syrian golden hamsters, there is there are the same kind of change, play-related changes induced in the medial prefrontal cortex neurons, and also it changes in their so social skills. Okay. And Syrian golden hamsters are typically solitary. Once once the, the litter is um, leave, leaves the mother, they disperse set up their own individual territories and then the only other times they're going to meet anybody else is either during mating or when the mother's rearing young so very different to the colony living rats so my guess is everybody has to have this basic level of social skill development 
in in that are mediated through the through the prefrontal cortex. However, what we also know is that when you look at particularly um, across a range of primates, some have much more complex social relationships in their social groups than others. So, and what you find is that that even well, an example is macaque monkeys. They they live in multi-male, multi-female groups. And the females form matrilines lines within which you have dominance relationships. And then the males have their own separate dominance relationships. And what happens is in, so all, all these macaques are exactly the same, but some have a much more rigid hierarchy. So basically if you're, you live in a group with a very rigid hierarchy structure, you know, based on who your mother was, where you are in, in that matter line, how you should behave. However, at the other extreme, um, macaque species, which have the same basic structure, but the, the hierarchy is much less rigid, less rigid, which means that if you're um, a dominant, you may go up to a subordinate and take their food, you know, 10 times in a row, and, and the subordinate takes it. If you're in one of these rigid macaque systems, if you're subordinate, you'll, you'll let your food be taken as many times as the dominant wants. If you're in one of these more loosely hierarchical uh, macaque species, if you're subordinate, you may tolerate, yeah, look, you've taken my food ten, nine times already. You take my, this piece of food, I'm going to bite you. And so now the dominant has to go, has to assess much more clearly, you know, how far can I push somebody before they're going to retaliate? And when you look at the play, the the the, the play in the in in the species with a less rigid hierarchy tends to tends to have more of these cooperative elements, like these self handicapping things I was talking about in rats. And so they have longer, more prolonged, more more reciprocal interactions than the play of these more rigidly structured ones. <clears throat> so I think there's a baseline everybody needs, but then depending on the social system how far, how much further you need to push that baseline to improve your social skills capabilities will depend on the social system that you live in. So sorry, that's a long-winded explanation, but it's it's a two-part story. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. No one. All right. So thank you, Serge. My pleasure. And, uh, Thanks for inviting me. We'll uh, hopefully see you soon. Hope so. Come so come to the mountain everyone. sometime. And, yeah, uh, we need to get over there to go skiing. There you go.